Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Mayo Moran. I'm the Provost of Trinity College, and it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you to the 16th in our ongoing series of conversations uh, with the Chancellor. Um, our Chancellor, Bill Graham, uh, who we're very fortunate uh, to have bring in many wonderful speakers, including the Right Honourable Joe Clark, uh, recently Carolyn Bennett, uh, Perry Belgard, uh, head of the AFN, and many other speakers who have, uh, I think, brought conversations that matter uh, to Trinity College. And tonight, we're incredibly honoured and, and thrilled uh, to be able to welcome uh, General Romeo Dallaire uh, to join us. Um, thank you. <laughs> Just so you know, General Dallaire, that doesn't always happen. <laughs> um, there's a good reason why it happens, of course, and I know that you, you know lots about General Dallaire and we'll learn more tonight, but I did want to just say a couple of words about his really remarkable uh, career. He's a celebrated advocate, as I'm sure you know, for human rights, especially with regard to child soldiers, veterans, and the prevention of mass atrocities. General Dallaire is also a respected government and UN advisor a best-selling author and, of course, a former Canadian senator. His courage and his uh, dedication at, during the United Nations assistance mission in Rwanda earned him numerous awards and is probably one of the reasons why he's so well known to people in this room, um, as well as the affection and dedication of people around the globe for that incredible work that he did during that mission. His defiant dedication to humanity during the mission has been well documented in films and in books. And indeed, last week, in my case, on my course, 10 Cases That Changed the World, I actually taught uh, the, uh, the, one of the cases in which uh, General Dallaire is mentioned, Akayesu, which is the first decision of the Rwandan uh, military tribunal. Mm -hmm. I think we also know and are very grateful uh, to General Dallaire, um, his revelation that he himself suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder led to advocacy and recognition of this very, very important issue. And I think his courage inspired many people to be able to face some of the challenges that we are now more aware are part and parcel of, of the kind of life that one leads if we're working on these kinds of missions. Since the publication of his book in 2010, They Fight Like Soldiers, They Die Like Children, The Global Quest to Eradicate the Use of Child Soldiers, General Dallaire's primary focus has been with his uh, Romeo Dallaire Child Soldiers Initiative, a global partnership that he founded whose mission is to end the recruitment and use of child soldiers. For these and for so many other reasons, General Dallaire, we're very, very honoured to have you join us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Very kind. Uh, well, General, thank you very much for coming. And uh, for the audience, uh, we'll have the usual format. Uh, our guest and I will talk for about an hour. And then we'll have about a half an hour where you can ask questions. And then we'll go next door. And as you know, uh, General Dallaire's books are here, and so uh, he's graciously said that he'd be willing to sign them, and so here's your opportunity. Don't miss it. Uh, I can speak as a fellow author. This is an important moment, isn't it? <laughs> we got to get those darn books out. <laughs> so, however, uh, let's start at the beginning and just talk just a little bit about your background. I know you were, your, your father was in the military, your mother's from Holland, a war bride, I guess, would be the what we said, uh, your own choice as a military career, did it come from the fact that your father had been a military person? My, my son is a, a captain in the army and he came back from Haiti and we live in Quebec City and uh, there were a lot of military there and a journalist came up to me and said, General, you said your son's in the army. And before I could respond, my son said, sir, I'm fourth generation army on my mother's side I'm third generation army on my father's side, and we're a family that lacks imagination. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I was born right after, in 46, so 
even my diapers were khaki, so I don't really have <laughs> any, any merit whatsoever than going down a road that I was familiar with. And my father was an NCO, so when I went to military college, uh, I, it was easier than being at home. So I, I, <laughs> I, I well, survived that. Well, and, uh, you didn't have to go through Trinity, which is a terrible yeah, disciplinary yeah, yeah. place. <laughs> But, but you did choose, you chose the artillery. Yes. Uh, is that because of a scientific reason? Because mathematics? I mean, is that why? Oh, what a lovely question. Because uh, uh, I'm just back from Vimy. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the story goes is that uh, the reason that most artillery officers and a few engineers commanded the very senior positions uh, from like Naughton on down in World War II is they were so far back in the fighting, they're the only ones that survived. Uh, but uh, and others would call the artillery the intelligentsia of the army. Uh, but very humbly is is that uh, um, we they used to bring us to all the different schools across the country from communications, logistics, infantry, armored, and so on. And we would spend three or four days in each place and uh, choose at the end of that uh, what branch that is to say we we request. And when we went to Shiloh, Manitoba, in the middle of nowhere. And I saw this young lieutenant uh, who was commanding a troop of four guns uh, and about 100 people, and they were all maneuvering and so on, and the dust and stuff and the noise. And I discovered that I liked power, and I liked firepower. And so I said, I'm in the artillery. And, oh. and it's been, uh, uh, I think a lot of our selections come from a sort of semi-romantic perspective because the regimental system and so on does influence us significantly. And you were, you were a Francophone. And in those days, the role of Francophones in the military, was it easy, acceptable? Was it a little bit different than it is today? Or? It was terrible. The, uh, my father in 64, uh, and he was an NCO, he, he, he said, Romeo, come for a walk the night before I left for military college and the, the Francophone military college at the time. And uh, he said, I want to tell you three things. He said, the first thing is, is that uh, if you make a career, you're going to have an interesting career. It'll, you'll see all kinds of things, and it'll be a, a valuable uh, uh, experience of life. He said, the second thing is you, you'll never be a millionaire. You'll never make money. You, you, so you, you don't make money, uh, but it'll be interesting. So that, that was pretty good. This, the uh, second element was, uh, remember you're at the service of the nation. So don't expect anybody to say thank you. You're not, you're, you're not serving for thanks, you're serving the nation. Well, but the third thing was- well, if you'd the, gone into politics, you would have realized how not to say thank you. Yeah, that's right, <laughs> how, uh, yes, how critical. <laughs> but the last thing he said, he said, Romeo, he said, if you want a, a career, and in particular in the artillery at the time, which was a little bit of a snobbish outfit. If you, <laughs> if you want a career, then you gotta change your name from Dallaire to Dallards, because as a French Canadian, you'll go nowhere. And I was 64, and then the bilingual law came in in 68. They created a French Canadian regiment, or a whole brigade in Belcarche, and I graduated in 69 uh, uh, into that, the first class to graduate uh, in a uh, bilingual and, and specifically a francophone unit. Um, but it took another 11 years for us to get the core and the system to accept that the Canadian artillery guns could fire in French. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, was, uh, it was sort of uh, scandalous to think that you would take the jargon that we use in fire discipline and so on, and that you could actually uh, translate it or adopt it in French. So I had soldiers c that I commanded who were using words they had absolutely no idea what they meant. Mm -hmm. Yet those words were critical to uh, combat and to life and death with, with that. It took 15 years after graduation uh, for uh, a very fine colleague of mine to tell me that uh, in his opinion, I was finally promoted, uh, not because I was a French Canadian, but because I deserved it. Mm. It's 15 years after. Uh, and so um, 
it's taken time, and we've always lived with this terrible construct that uh, uh, you would get instructions in English, and at the bottom there would be this line saying, French text later. <laughs> and it usually never came. <laughs> and so it, it was not easy. And the last thing I'd say is, is that the more we pushed for being able to write in French and to be able to function in French, um, the uh, more we were being identified as nationalists and even sovereignists, and some even thought we were at one point in the 70s, particularly as uh, subversive elements uh, in, in the organization. Uh, but we, my classmates, in my, and I being the first class to graduate uh, with, with orders in English and in French on parade, we said, we will never let our soldiers die in the language of the officer. <clears throat> the officer will learn the language of the soldier and understand the culture of the soldier, and the soldier will die knowing that his officer knew who he was and what he was and what he was saying in his last words. And that's a promise that uh, we, we made in 69, and that's one that we continuously keep fighting for. And I think it's fair to say today that the bilingual nature of our forces are considered internationally as one of our great strengths, are they not? I mean, it, it, yes, in fact, very much so. And what was what's marvelous is that so many uh, of the Anglophone background have learned French, uh, coming from uh, bilingual schools, coming from immersion schools, and so on, uh, and others learning it on their own without having to have a year-long course because the French Canadians never had a year-long course. We just had immersion mm -hmm. uh, or survival, depending on how you looked at it. <laughs> uh, and so uh, uh, one of the extraordinary assets of our, of our nation regarding uh, operations overseas is the fact that not only do we understand English and French, but we understand the cultural differences because commanding a French Canadian regiment is different than commanding an English Canadian regiment. One is very paternalistic and, 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 and very uh, family. The other one tends to like to have space and people are more independent and uh, it's a different uh, construct. You don't get the same, uh, the same relationship. And so knowing all that is an extraordinary asset in, in the world right now. And would that have been a a significant factor in the reason you were chosen to lead the UN mission? No, uh, it was because I was a good, good general and I was very competent. Yes, but were you able to, uh, no. apart from your competence, <laughs> yes, uh, is it uh, fair to say you were able uh, to do a little well, communicating with somebody else who was if you had, If you had Rick Hillier here, I'm trying to imitate him just a bit. So, 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 so. So, yeah, but General Rick Hillier's from Newfoundland, for heaven's sakes. Is a another minority, a another culture. minority. <laughs> I, uh, 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 I, it was critical because the uh, uh, majority of the population in Rwanda were Fran Francophone, uh, and the uh, minority of the population were English speaking, uh, and uh, the rebel forces were uh, uh, sp English speaking because they were linked with the minority, of course. And so, as an example, when uh, I met with them in my reconnaissance, we took the peace agreement and we walked through every page to make sure that we all understood exactly what it meant. And, and so uh, they, would, they would say in English, yes, we agree, and then I'd translate it and they, in French, they'd say, oui, pas de problème. But sometimes it, it, didn't, it didn't work. And so I'd, I'd say, you talk in Kinirwande, sort it out and tell me what the result is. And so it, it was absolutely critical to have someone who masters the language, right. which, which meant the culture. And in so doing, Canada uh, was identified very early on. Uh, the French, uh, the uh, Belgians who were very much involved there, the, um, the Rwandans themselves from both sides uh, had absolutely no problem when uh, Canada was mentioned, and then uh, when my name came up, they just looked at that I had commanded a brigade group of 5,000 troops, and my whole experience was in command, so they, they said fine. But, but you did tell me this afternoon that uh, 
a French commander or a Belgian commander really would not have been acceptable. So really, Canada so was the Francophone country of, of choice. Yes, it, uh, unless you went to Switzerland, maybe, or you know, or Luxembourg. But there, there was. Uh, Are there five thousand troops in Luxembourg? No, there's not. <laughs> but they, they, they didn't want. Uh, um, they didn't want a commander uh, that could not uh, master the political nuances and the interfacing of the, uh, the, the, the population and the political and, and wanted you to be able to, to really understand what was behind what was being said. And so uh, Canada provides that. And, and, uh, and now I'm quite proud to say that it, uh, you get that level of capability from Anglophone officers as much as you get from Francophone officers. It's not only one-sided anymore. Well, I, I, when I was minister, I quite often quoted you, and I'm going to give you a quote back that you said. You said, after this event, and we'll come back to Rwanda, but you did say, the era of a general who only knows how to fight is gone. A general must know how to be a diplomat and a humanist. Generals who argue that we only go in with clear mandates and time frames, sorry, we're in an era of complexity and ambiguity. And if you can't operate in ambiguity, you've got a problem. Is that basically where you were when you got to Rwanda? Yeah. The mandate, the mandate was Im impossible to, to implement. Uh, I, I mean, the mandate essentially said, um, establish an atmosphere of security. So uh, the question is, is, what is established? Do I fight to establish that? Or do, do I uh, hope it's there? And, and what is an atmosphere of security, a police state? Uh, and so the words were coming out, but there was nothing behind the words. There was no doctrine, there was no concepts, political concepts or any of nature. It was just a lot of words. So we were thrown in to this new era. We stumbled into this new era after the Cold War in these imploding nations and failing states uh, with really nothing except words, and you try to figure it out in the field. And that's why we so often ended up with not the resources we needed or the decisions we needed. Uh, and then, uh, remember, we come out of the Cold War. So uh, that's everything post-World uh, War II. And so we were all educated by veterans of World War II and Korea. And so we were fundamentally warriors. And uh, peacekeeping was a sideshow. I mean, 3% of our time was in peacekeeping, even though Canada thought we were great peacekeepers, well, we were, but it was a small job. 97% of my time was, was learning how to kill Russians. In, in, mm -hmm. And so uh, we end up with no more fight. Uh, and in these civil wars uh, where the population is mixed in with the, with the, and so it became obvious that uh, all our background was experiential, drills and methods and so on. Uh, but what we needed was a lot more intellectual depth to understand the complexities of these problems and to, to try to figure out why this w you can't bring a ceasefire here or why you can't maneuver there and be participant in the solutions. And so the aim was to move the guns as far back as we could and be far more forward in part of the resolution with the diplomats, with the humanitarians, and so on. And in so doing... Uh, we created a great havoc in the forces because you had the cold warriors who felt that we were losing our warrior ethic because ultimately we would be called to do that someday possibly. But there was another smaller school of thought that said, no, uh, we can handle in this era, we can handle remaining warriors and in extremists, if we have to use force and be credible using force, we can, we can do that but uh, that we can also be fully participatory as a value added in the solution by bringing the security uh, dimension into the fray of the discussion. And so that's why uh, uh, when I was involved with the reform of the officer corps after Somalia, which you all remember, uh, in 1999, we introduced um, something uh, that was of the nature uh, of we called it a sort of advanced leadership, but what it really was is we brought into the curriculum of the military college, which is the core of our profession, the officer corps, and the core is in the military colleges. The, 
the subjects for all, even the engineers and so on, anthropology, sociology, and philosophy. And only with those that we thought that we could start to understand more the nuances that we were facing out there. So when you, uh, reading your book about Rwanda, obviously, you arrived there, I mean, one thing about the theory, but as I understand it, I mean, you were, you had two big problems. You didn't have a force that was large enough to be able to take charge of the situation, and you didn't have rules of engagement e that even allowed you to take dramatic action when you felt you had to take dramatic action. So It's very quite correct. The, my initial assessment said I needed uh, about 4,600 troops. Um, and the UN was being uh, under duress because the Americans had not paid their dues. And so it was running out of cash. Uh, there was Yugoslavia that was building up massively. Cambodia was still ongoing. Haiti was starting up. You had Mozambique also they were calling. So they had, a, they had bigger uh, missions. And mine was supposed to be simply a peace agreement under Chapter 6, which meant is they needed a referee uh, without a red card to, to help them work their way through it. And so uh, we, we walked in there with half the size of the force and equipped to simply observe, report, and assist. And uh, the era of that sort of classic peacekeeper that we all knew with short pants and a baseball bat sort of thing, uh, and a beret ended uh, in Rwanda because we ended up observing. So how many people can you stand there and observe being slaughtered? And, and, and is that what we're supposed to be able to do? And that is why uh, we, uh, subsequent to that, I'm afraid, uh, shifted to Chapter 7, which means we have a responsibility to protect and you deploy with forces that can do it. So, well, when Rick went into Sarajevo, he was under a, a Chapter 7 type of construct right, right. Uh, and he came in with fully armored uh, battalions and so on. Yes, a totally different. Uh, we, we don't, we're going to come back to some of the lessons we learned. But, I mean, for you, it was, was it the death of the president, basically the assassination of the president, the plane crash that then that tipped the, the, the peace agreement that was destroyed at that point? And it was... Uh, uh, it was the, the, the trigger, but the, the bullet that of, of the genocide really came uh, from uh, the ineptness of uh, the international community of bringing to the fore uh, competence in regards to conflict resolution of complex scenarios like that, where it's interseen and what are the uh, um, um, the, um, the tribalism and the uh, ethnicity and, and even not so much the religion but the search for power and extremists who did not want, who signed under duress. We needed people who, who could f function more effectively in that. And in those days uh, they just chose, you know, uh, by whatever favor or so on that was going on at the time. And uh, I think the the, uh, what broke the back, because there was a lot of tension and there was a lot of maneuvering and we knew that the forces were, were, were preparing to, to restart the fight. Uh, what broke the back is, is that somebody came up with the idea that the extremist Hutu majority party, uh, a, a majority uh, uh, party, uh, it was representing a small group of the majority, but it was part of the Hutu, that uh, who had not signed any of the agreement, that we should include them in the discussions of trying to resolve the implementation of the political process. Uh, and when they did that, that forced the other, the other side, the rebel side, uh, to not be able to negotiate anymore because those extremists essentially had made it clear they wanted to wipe out. Uh, and so the word genocide was not used, but the word of mass destruction and killing uh, had been uh, quite, quite used quite often. And so uh, it was an impasse. 
And then the UN said, we, we we're going to give you only six weeks, and if you don't solve it, we're pulling out. So that created another tension. Um, the division of tasks, uh, they, they had the president remain president, but they divided up the cabinet in such a way that the rebel force ended up by Minister of Justice, Minister of Interior, and head of the police. So the president said, how long do you think I'm going to last before they throw me in jail? And so we had all these scenarios that had permitted to happen. And so whoever shot it, the plane down uh, simply uh, gave the, the signal for something that was already well planned right. and prepared to, to implement. And internationally, my understanding is that uh, the Americans would not allow the use of the word genocide in New York because it would then trigger the obligation under the Genocide Convention to do something. And because legally, we never talked about the genocide while it was going on because uh, that would have then meant the international community had an obligation to do more than they were doing. It, 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 you're quite correct. And uh, Tony Lake was the advisor to Clinton at the time, and he's now the head of UNICEF International, which we work a lot with. And I'm wearing a UNICEF tie too on top of that. Uh, but he owes me a lot, and he knows that. So, <laughs> but but uh, uh, Bill Clinton had established um, an atmosphere in his administration after Mogadishu Black Hawk Down, uh, and those bodies of those Rangers dragged through the streets, uh, that he would uh, apply a presidential directive that said the United States will not intervene unless its self-interests are at risk. Well, a humanitarian mission in the middle of a small country where there's absolutely no resources uh, and, it's, and it's just black Africans killing black Africans did not carry any weight. And so uh, the morning of the, um, the, the start of the uh, genocide when the Security Council met in that side room where they, they actually discussed there, uh, she, she stood up and said that the Americans would not support uh, any intervention by anyone and will not be in, engaged uh, in, this, uh, in this genocide. And so Mogadishu happened four or five months before and with the Americans not being able to provide strategic lift and certain assets, uh, Africans couldn't even get there. They didn't have the equipment uh, and essentially nobody wanted to come. There was no value in risking lives after Mogadishu and the fear of casualties overrode everything else. Well, I know some members of the audience will want, particularly the students may want to ask you more questions about Rwanda itself, but I think you and I want to talk a little bit about the, the lessons we learned, and you, mm. you did point out, less, first lesson we learned was peacekeeping is not about blue berets walking up and down a line, it's not a Cyprus operation anymore. Again, when I was minister, I had to emphasize the fact we needed properly trained, properly equipped, troops, but with the key thing, having rules of engagement that allowed them to take actions which could enforce the peace when they have to. And now when we go into these missions, you're in a situation where, as Luis Arbour has pointed out, you don't really know who the enemy is sometimes. It may be the host government, it may be you're, you're an obligation to protect the civilian population, but it's another part of the civilian population, like in your case, that was killing so the ambiguity and the fluidity of the situation puts a tremendous stress on our soldiers. At, at all levels. I mean, the, from the corporal guarding uh, a post to the force commander. Uh, and it's interesting that although you negotiate the rules of engagement with the Security Council through the Secretary General uh, before you leave, the rules of engagement might be, let's say, this wide. Um, but uh, what happens is uh, when you look at the size of troops you have and what you can actually accomplish and their training, because you have no control on what training they get and they come from all over the place and what equipment they get, that tends to reduce the rules of engagement because you know they can't do all this other stuff because they'll simply get killed and they're, they're, they'll, they'll screw it up. So you reduce your rules of engagement. Then, then you'll get countries, let's say, like, like Belgium told me, uh, we can't handle these rules of engagement because our troops are not trained to do crowd control, because we were expecting that. So uh, for the Belgians, the rules of engagement became that small. Uh, and then uh, the, the commander of the Bangladesh forces uh, came to visit me and said, I've sent troops here to learn, to, to gain experience, because it was supposed to be an easy mission. 
and so I am not ex accepting any casualties. Well, then that sort of that reduces your rules of engagement mm. that much. And so by the time you're actually trying to apply it, with untrained uh, or poorly trained, poorly equipped forces not having sufficient capabilities, uh, you can have that wider rule of engagement coming out of New York, but you may only be able to apply uh, this much. And that's the, 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 the horror of uh, the peacekeeping construct is, is the fact that you don't uh, have the ability to influence significantly who's coming, what they're coming with, and, and what they can do. So think of it, during the Cold War, we were doing chapter six, when nations were going at nations, and when they were tired, they'd sign a peace agreement, we'd be there to help them you know, work their way through it. Uh, and those, that was the time of Canada and Ireland and uh, the, the Dutch a bit, and uh, you know, the, the, it was a rich man's exercise because we had all the equipment and so on. So there were about only 13 to 16 countries that actually did peacekeeping. Then the Cold War ends, and all the big players leave peacekeeping. And because the, the peace dividend was there, we don't need military anymore, so you know, we, let, we reduce, so we reduce significantly. We don't, we, we the North, the Northern countries, don't do the missions, but then the missions start to appear in these imploding nations and fairly safe, and they're complicated and they're ambiguous and we don't know exactly, and who's left to send troops, but countries that need the money or countries that, and so as the missions got more complex, we stayed farther away. Yeah. And, and I think that's, a, that's something that we will carry in history, is, is that uh, no matter how good we were, uh, when it became very complicated and high risk, uh, and then after Rwanda, when there was mass atrocities and even genocide, uh, we essentially stayed away. And now when you look at a country like Mali, 51 different countries in a multilateral, multinational operation, mm. as you say, with some of them very sophisticated surveillance and other uh, medical and other facilities, the Europeans, and then others from countries where they have but rudimentary facilities to look after their own personnel and worried about problems with violence with the communities, the sexual violence issues, uh, all of these things. Uh, are, do you think that we have, however, made progress in being able to manage these types of missions now compared to the period you're talking about? I think uh, w there's now approximately 110,000 peacekeepers in, I think it's 16 missions around the world. Uh, how many of them are effective? Uh, maybe there's 20,000 of them, maybe. Uh, the equipment is rudimentary. Uh, in, in most places. So um, uh, the UN has never built enough uh, stocks nor capacity to be able to equip countries to do the job. And the countries with the equipment uh, were, were not necessarily always wanting to give it. Uh, even with Rwanda, the Americans had over 3,000 armored vehicles sitting in Europe, uh, but they finally agreed to rent 50 of them to me. Uh, uh, and, and I had to even paint them and so on. So uh, the, the nature uh, of, the, of peacekeeping has now become peace support operations. It's become uh, attempting to look at how to help stabilize, how to uh, be maybe intervention, how to uh, prevent if you get there early enough. Uh, but it doesn't have uh, enough uh, uh, stamina to be able to sustain these complex operations if it's calling the fight. Now, uh, two years ago in the Congo, uh, one of my officers who was with me uh, became the chief of staff of a special brigade in the Congo mission, uh, and they finally put a force together to do a massive counterattack on the rebels, and that was proven to be very successful. But it was so successful that people started to question whether or not that was peacekeeping or as an intervention. And then a whole bunch of other questions started to arise of whether or not that, that should be. So I, I would say we got more experience. But the big, the big uh, deficiency comes from two sides. One, Kofi Annan had produced about 100 recommendations 
at the request of the Americans who brought him in to, back to Malak to become the uh, Secretary General, uh, to bring in about 100 recommendations to reform the UN. And they were significant. And, and from Security Council to hiring to all kinds of things. Uh, three months before he presented them in 2005, the American uh, Ambassador Bolton at the time, uh, who's hanging around, I gather, Mr. Trump. Anyway, Bolton vetoed all those recommendations. That so they themselves had proposed. Eh? They were basically, they proposed them and then they vetoed them. They, 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 they were backing mm -hmm. doing it and then they, they, they vetoed the, them. So they've never really been picked up. And without those major reforms, there will still be significant deficiencies, even though it's still probably one of the better games in town. The, the second element is that, and it came out in Libya, is that the Security Council has no command and control capability. It has no planning capability. It has no intelligence capability whatsoever because the peacekeeping operations, DPKO, are essentially what we would call a force generator. Mm -hmm. They send forces there with a, and, and give them to somebody to actually implement a, a, a mandate. But the headquarters, the Security Council, has no way of knowing exactly what's going on and getting you know, military advice directly related to them to, so they can take a Security Council solution. It's got no planning capability, so contingency planning, none of that. So without any of that, you get Libya, where NATO takes off with the mission, and the Security Council says, whoa, what happened here? There's regime change. We didn't call for that. And you talk to the Canadian commander of the mission, uh, who, who is a lovely gentleman, a three-star Canadian Air Force, and mm. I asked him, From I Winnipeg. said... From eh? Winnipeg. From Winnipeg. From Winnipeg, yeah, yeah. Bouchon, good yeah. guy. And, and so uh, I asked him, I said, how many times did you brief the Security Council on your operations? He said, never. I said, who did you brief? He said, my command, military command change in NATO. So when I when I asked, well, who's NATO briefing? Nobody. The information that was getting into the Security Council was coming in through the French, the Brits, and the Americans, and whatever the, the Chinese or Russians would permit. And the other guys tried to feed some stuff in. So this ad hocery at the highest level inspires absolutely no confidence in, in seeing potential success. And so when you end up in a, in a problem, well, you end up ad hocing it. You end up crisis managing, and you end up always catching up with the bad guys. We talked this afternoon about two sort of micro issues that are, I think, quite interesting. Uh, that I think our audience would be interested in. One was, I told you how when I was in the UN recently, our Indian colleagues told us that they have a whole battalion of, of women mm -hmm. that they deploy as a, as a battalion, not odd women here and there in the force, but as a group, and they find that very effective. Is that, has that been your experience? So you did tell me some interesting stories about how women can be very influential yeah. in these missions. I'm, I'm not convinced that formed women units is, is, a, is a solution, uh, but I am absolutely and totally for uh, the significant increase of women uh, in the security forces, police and military, and in operational roles in the front. Uh, they are, in my opinion, a force multiplier in these very complex missions where you can find solutions uh, that are not necessarily in the book or classic. Um, we, I, I have forces that we've been training. Uh, um, they come from Sierra Leone, but we train them. They're in Somalia, working for the African Union. Um, and, and during the training, uh, we had men and women in, in uniform. So we went and got all the guys together and said, is there any difference between men peacekeepers and women peacekeepers? Oh, no, we're all the same, do the same thing, you know, same rules and so on. Then we went to the women. We said, is there any difference between women peacekeepers? And <laughs> Holy smoke. <laughs> <laughs> One very simple example. Uh, we're... we're uh, fighting El-Shabaab, uh, which uses massively child soldiers in Somalia. 
And these kids are used in Somalia for banditry. Uh, they're used in Mali to fight. They're used as child pirates on, on the seas too. So uh, we were trying to get at the leadership uh, in Somalia uh, who support, a lot of them support us, to, to shift gears and to, and to adjust to a potential uh, peace arrangement. And uh, we were getting nowhere. Then all of a sudden, we, we had a, a number, a few of the women uh, observers, informally uh, establish contact with uh, women, Muslim women, who were there, who brought them through a, a variety of tea, uh, tea parties or tea meetings and so on, to actually the wives of some of the El Shabaab leaders. And uh, not, didn't bring them to negotiate with them, but brought them to the wives of these characters and talked about, you know, why are you using kids and this and that and so on. And they were able to influence the husbands to adjust. The guys couldn't even get close to the women. And so uh, their a child soldier is still a child. So in the front lines, if the opportunity is there, they can still influence uh, and keep the, uh, the tone down and the like. So I've, uh, and we found, uh, we found them keen, really keen to be innovative. And so in these complex and ambiguous missions where you're full of ethical and moral and legal dilemmas, you need intellectual agility, uh, a new think. Uh, and so from our traditional think, they tend to, to fly in from left field and, and uh, it's a great asset. So, uh, women who fill the ranks of the NGO community, I know my, I'm not an NGO, I'm an institute at Dalhousie, but we, we work with all the NGOs uh, who are affected, working with children. Uh, I mean, it's 93% women and you might find a couple guys there. Well, if, if a lot of those women, instead of joining NGOs, were able to engage in the security forces and change the nature of security, we could potentially bring uh, new angles to the solution. And you also mentioned the extraordinary role that the Padres play. Uh, that's ah, a very, yes. that I don't think many people, although one of our, we gave an honorary degree to the, cap, the Colonel Chaplain General, General. Chaplain General a couple of years ago here, and he spoke very movingly about uh, that. And I was always impressed by the fact that Canada's chaplains are multidisciplinary in that you might get a Jewish chaplain, you might get a Muslim chaplain, you might get a Sikh, you might get a Catholic, but, but they, they work across and they work with one another. It's an unusual organization in that way. Most forces don't operate that way. No. But they can be helpful in these missions, I understand. Yeah, and, and they, fill the, they fill the spectrum not only of religion, but they fill the spectrum of race also and color because, as an example, the Catholic Church is in such dire need of the priests is that you'll end up with Senegalese and you'll end up with uh, Mali or whatever uh, priests that are now in parishes in Quebec that then the diocese lets them join the forces. And so you're getting extraordinary breadth. The ones who picked up the fastest on the need for more skills and knowledge and how to um, reduce the capabilities of child soldiers and in fact uh, help neutralize them were the Padres and we've trained the Padres and so they talk with the Imans in the field and they have a parallel communications and I see General Fraser here and, and so on. I mean we commanders can talk but the Padres can work from a different completely different angle uh, and so operationalizing the Padres is a, a brand new extraordinary asset uh, and to see them, see them so keen that the Chaplain General was at the Vatican and briefed on the work we were doing. And the Vatican has been looking at, uh, in the end of May, we go brief them because the Pope is very concerned about child soldiers and the youth, well, he's concerned about war affected children and children in conflict and so on. And, and so it, it is quite right out of left field uh, that, that all of a sudden the Padre is not just helping the guys but the, the, and the girls, the, but the Padre is actually there in the front lines 
uh, maneuvering. I was, I, there's, I've always known there was something subversive about the Trinity Divinity faculty, and now, <laughs> now we know there's more going on underneath the surface there. The provost is nodding. I know the provost won't let me let us get out of here, General, if I don't ask you about international humanitarian law and the importance uh, that Canada has always placed in it. We were instrumental in getting the Rome Statute adopted. Uh, I've worked a lot recently with Louise Arbour, and she's quite quite discouraged about, the, particularly because of Syria and what is taking place there, and, and a feeling that uh, we're sliding backwards in the, uh, in the way in which we're able to bring the rule of, of law to, to these conflicts. So would that be your reading of things, or do you see more, are you more positive? No, I, I, I don't, uh, uh, I, I wouldn't fully agree with, uh, with that, because uh, I think that the international humanitarian law and so on hit its high watermark around 2000. Uh, you had the Rome Statute, the International Criminal Court. You had the Optional Protocol on Child Rights. You had the Landmines Treaty. Uh, you had the uh, Treaty on, the, on Stopping the Proliferation of Small Arms, which were being used uh, by, by children. Um, uh, you had uh, uh, the start of the study on responsibility to protect, which is the doctrine that says that sovereignty is no more an absolute, that if there's massive abuse of human rights, uh, we have all of us the responsibility to go in and stop it, uh, to protect the civilians. So we, we had that high water mark. The, the question that I believe now is in, in the quandary is, is that um, we've got a bunch of tools but we're not, we don't have the statesmanship to, to make them work. We have a, a lot of political maneuvering, but a lot of risk averseness, fear of casualties, fear of putting boots on the ground. Uh, and because of that, uh, we don't seem to be able to operationalize some of the, these tools, like uh, responsibility of fear, which are preventive tools. They're not all simply invasion and blowing the place apart, but part of prevention, to get in early and to be engaged in a variety of, of pillars, diplomatic and so on, within extremists, the use of force uh, as, uh, as a, the ultimate means if, if necessary. So uh, where I think my concern would be is not the fact that we've got all the laws and we've got the court and everything else and we've been identifying what is, uh, laws against humanity and so on. We've started arresting some people and, and doing that. Uh, I think the, the weakness is the fact that we haven't found the statesmanship that's got the guts to apply it, that, 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 that is prepared to go through the gamut of options. And in extremists, yes, uh, it's not from, from the air only where you're going to solve these things. You've got to get on the ground and you got to be there, and it's not by taking sides in these conflicts, but instead of, uh, instead of bringing back a whole neutrality uh, to it. And so it's a bit of a revirement uh, in its fact, is that instead of going and blasting the place apart, what you want to do is separate and protect the civilians from whatever the government forces and so on, and uh, be an intermediary to permit uh, a resolution to happen. Yeah. You were remarking, though, that the situation in Syria, for example, where a lot of it is urban warfare, makes it very difficult to apply rules of proportionality and other rules that are designed really for a, a, a regular combat situation. But when you're, when you don't know the difference between the civilians and the and the soldiers, it's very hard to to uh, apply a lot of these rules. You're, you're, all, you're absolutely right. There's no worse, there's no worse war than a civil war. Uh, and, and I'll give you the example, just uh, I was commanding the, the college, uh, military college near Oka, during the Oka crisis, and I'm sure many of you remember it. And we, we maneuvered to get the pregnant women, the children, and the elderly to be evacuated out of that enclave, because an accident could turn the whole thing into a Northern Ireland and so on. And so we warned the population of the villages that we were driving through that we, that was in the convoy. And we, we uh, could see the people along, along the road mad because they had to do two hours more a day of uh, getting to work and so on. 
Uh, and uh, as the convoy kept going through the village, people were getting madder and madder, and they started throwing stones and rocks and bricks. And they were actually, you could see in the eyes of those people, just normal citizens. They were ready to kill these people. If they could get their hands into them, and they were smashing windshields and everything, and they did injure elderly women, pregnant women and children. They knew it. So that's here because of the, the, it, it's disrupted their way of life. So, of course, in these frictions in these countries, the, the scale of destruction and human destruction is, 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 is off the, the, the chart. And instead of that being rendered more uh, under a certain level of control, we see, even with child soldiers, that they're making them more sophisticated. You know, the Al Shabaab, the Boko Haram, the ISIS, uh, the British have asked us to go and help them with the ISIS. I mean, these are well-trained, indoctrinated fighters at 14, 13. Uh, and so uh, it's not just the kids standing with an AK-47 or something. It's, it's a lot more sophisticated. And so I would argue that the complexity and the ambiguity continues to grow. The solutions are very often very tactical in the field and attempt through good, uh, good relationships between the different disciplines, the military, the security, the, uh, and even between police and military, the humanitarians, the diplomats, the nation builders, and so on. When in the field they get along, you will get cooperation, you'll get coordination, you'll get collaboration. But all those disciplines come from the Cold War, which we spent 300 years since Westphalia building. Those tools, to me, don't work anymore. What we need is a whole new set of tools, a new conceptual framework uh, that integrates those disciplines. And so there's the humanitarian space is something of the past. Neutrality is something of the past. Uh, the use of the simple military are there to fight wars is, is something of the past. Uh, and what the new thing is, we haven't figured it out. So there is an impatience, but we've only been at it for 25 years. And so we're still on job training a lot, particularly at the strategic level, mm -hmm. particularly at the strategic level, to try to get ahead of the game. And I, I feel that uh, there is some work being done, but people don't want to be a multidisciplinary leader, somebody who can handle those disciplines in depth and create a whole new way of, of operating, a new lexicon of operating. And unless we do that, uh, we're still going to be um, marginalized and we're still going to get surprised. And I think we will see, because they're using children as primary weapons, we're going to see now generational wars. The kid, uh, after being a child at 18 doesn't die, the child becomes an adult. And if that child, all it knows is how to fight and kill and hasn't got an education, hasn't got a job, can't marry, what do you think he's going to do? Or she's going to do? Because 40% of them are girls. So we are creating generational wars uh, because we haven't been able to get ahead of the game. And you, 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 your child soldier initiative mm -hmm which you're focused on very strongly now, are you seeing some progress in, in, in dealing with the issue of the phenomenon of child soldiers specifically? Or? We, we are training contingents uh, in Africa. We're training uh, uh, national forces to, to change their attitude towards children. I'll give you an example. We were in Sierra Leone for two years training the police and the military on a whole new doctrine on how to look at children and how to uh, make children ineffective without killing them because uh, you can consider them a combatant and then it's, it's the rules of engagement permit you to, 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 to shoot. But how many kids do you think we can handle before we start having a problem looking at our own children when we come back? So uh, th 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 that problem is, is, is significant. So the, the uh, children that were in, in, engaged uh, in in, uh, in uh, Sierra Leone uh, were engaged in a survival because of uh, the Ebola crisis. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of adults died. 
And so the kids were abandoned. And they don't, didn't have a social system, so they ended up in the streets. So a lot of the kids were starting to be abused, abducted, and all kinds of things. But the police and the military that we had trained realized that these kids existed because they saw them as children. They didn't see them as 13-year-old adults. They saw them as children, and they saw they were vulnerable. So they contacted us, and we kept a running conversation on how they actually built school, how they picked up all these kids, and instead of treating them like, like another pain in the neck, they actually took them in and helped them. The realization that a child at 13 is still a child surprises us because we look at it as a combative capability. And it's amazing that when you remind them they're a child, uh, that all of a sudden you say, wait a minute, we, we got to take another look at it. And so we literally changed the ethos of those militaries towards children in their own country and, of course, uh, overseas uh, or in missions where they, they will deploy. And uh, in doing that, uh, we're fiddling with their cultural framework, which I believe has got to happen if we really believe in human rights. And so when I'm told that a 13-year-old girl uh, is an adult in this culture, I say bullshit. She's a 13-year-old pregnant girl. She is not an adult. Even at 18, they, we, they have a problem being adults. Look at how many car crashes these and, and, and how much trouble the 18-year-olds get into. And so not at physically, this no, uh, no, not no, here. No, no, no. In the military college, though, yeah, we don't think. Well, we know so, all about military uh, colleges yeah. there. <laughs> so so it, 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 is, it is changing the nature uh, where, in this era, one of the new weapons of choice is the massive recruitment of children to fight adult wars. And they're being recruited because they're children. And I was at Vimy, and there were 16 and 17 year olds there that fought. Well, uh, we didn't recruit them because they were children, but they snuck in and they were marginal elements. But now they are the primary instrument of these conflicts and they sustain it because of the demographics. Well, that's, uh, the ch I won't uh, pursue that because we could go on a lot about how we're dealing with that, but what about, what about our own troops? Because another feature of, of your books, and which I think of extend, un given Canadians a better understanding of, of how our own troops suffer sometimes as a result of these operations. And I, you said in a Globe and Mail article about the fate of Lionel Desmond, who killed his own family and then committed suicide, you said the scale of the damage and the depth of the destruction that deployment in today's complex conflicts can wreck is almost incomprehensible. And you went on to say in the same article that the Veterans Affairs Department is underfunded, strangled by regulations, and wholly unprepared for the post-war demand. Do you see any improvements? Uh, do we yes, but it's, it's incremental. Uh, you know, we spend, and you were minister, sir, and you know, we spend billions uh, training and equipping forces to deploy. We spend billions as they're deployed to make sure they can do the job uh, and get the support they need to achieve the mission. We spend billions when they come back and reshaping the equipment, rebuying new one and replacing and bringing back the ammunition stocks. And we spend peanuts on families, on uh, medical capabilities uh, of the mind, not necessarily medical, physical, because if you remember uh, MASH and so on, We've, we've aced that one. I mean, uh, what's the percentage? 99%, I should ask General Fraser, of, of those who were injured in, in combat, how many we, we got them back and physically saved them. But where's, where's the mash for the psychological injury, the operational stress injury? And, and, and why uh, are we letting those injuries fester and become uh, worse? We lost 158 in Afghanistan. We're now close to 70 who have committed suicide directly related to being psychologically injured in Afghanistan. So it's terrible to be at a ramp ceremony or the, the, the Highway of Heroes, mm. uh, you know, when the body comes back and, and all that. It's, it's absolutely horrific. 
But imagine the family that they've got an injured veteran coming back psychologically. And then for three years, they've been living with this person who's like this all the time, probably beating up the wife. God knows that they're drinking or drugs or everything. The kids don't want to talk about it. They got no place to turn. We've seen now suicides amongst the teenagers of families where these soldiers exist. And then all of a sudden one morning you wake up and they hung themselves in the, in the bathroom. Imagine the, the scale of suffering that family went through. They get no recognition. We talk about the 158. Those families get next to nothing. We've started to do a bit, but they get, they get next to nothing. So we created uh, family support centers on our big bases. We got 30 out of them uh, to help families and so on. Uh, their budget is 38 million bucks for families of regular force, reserves, and now injured veterans. 30, 31 million bucks. And there's no way they can, they can meet the challenge. And so there's, a, there's an incredible disconnect in, in not, because we're very visual, I think, and so on, in not recognizing that the injury between the ears, one, it's honorable, and two, it's real, and three, if it's not treated, it can lead to death. And the longer it takes to get at it, the deeper it becomes and the, and the length of it. And uh, I, I think I'm an in-person because I got a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And I, and I uh, speak of it very openly because if I had a heart problem, I'd talk about my cardiologist. I had a diabetes problem, I talk about my doctor who's a dummy because he's not treating me well for, for, for diabetes. But if I got a psychiatrist, psychologist, we don't talk about it. That's stupid. And I am approaching the point of, of now that we've got so much information going on and we are working at trying to, to get a grip of this injury, is I'm approaching the point of starting to accuse those who are injured and their leaders that if they don't come forward and continue to demand more, I'll hold them accountable for the injured who are going to come down the road with the next operation because we didn't resolve properly this one. And so we've created a, a research center, a virtual one in Canada, to better prepare, better help in theater and also afterwards. Uh, but uh, I believe that still the policy, the new Veterans Charter, the old one was dated 1943. The new Veterans Charter uh, is really disgraceful because it is a, it's sort of like a insurance policy. It's a workman's compensation. Ladies and gentlemen, that's not what you do with veterans who are part of our society and voluntarily are prepared to, to protect us. Uh, and so they volunteered, you know, so, but they volunteered to protect us. They know what they're getting in, but the nation needs them to do that job. So what we need is a covenant, not a social contract. You don't negotiate whether you get killed or not or so on. A covenant. And the covenant is from cradle to grave. And the covenant essentially uh, uh, articulates the fact that uh, they put the life on the line, some of them died, some of them do die subsequently, some are injured all their life and their families, and that is part of the deal, that's part of the, the cost of, of war, is that, uh, that we treat them with dignity and respect, and their families, which, which Veterans Canada is still so far behind, and that they don't have to fight again to live decently as injured veterans in this country. Well, I think uh, I'd like to, I'm not going to ask you about the Senate because that oh. might <laughs> stir. My such favorite a, That might stir uh, <laughs> unfortunate. I hope somebody from the crowd will. But I'm, uh, but I'm going to leave that opportunity to uh, our, our, our guest, uh, uh, General, I think it's time now where I know there are people here who would like to ask you questions. And there are many questions that arise from your wonderful books, the films about you, your life in the Senate, or other fields. So please, please, uh, do we have any? 
somebody bless me. Well, in that case, I'm going to ask you about the Senate. Well, <laughs> the, we're not. Oh, that was <laughs> the, the, the <coughs> Here we are. Oh, good. Just yes. talk loud because I'm an artillery officer. Yes, he is artillery, you know, so you got to tell. Sir, I've forgotten the name of the president of Rwanda. Kagame. Thank you. Uh, he spoke uh, kind of respectfully of him in your book. Have you followed his career? Is it an interesting story for you as how a political figure develops? He is ruthless, uh, but he is brilliant. Um, and uh, the campaign that they, that they conducted against a significantly superior force in numbers anyways, uh, is a magnificent example of military operations, low intensity, uh, that should be studied by, by many uh, institutions, military institutions. Um, he um, is a man of enormous frugality and uh, he suffered in Uganda from the fact of being a Rwandan refugee there, served with their forces, fought Idi Amin, and essentially was then told that, listen, you're not going to get promoted, you're not going to be, we, we're sort of tired of you guys being here and we'd like you to leave and, and uh, lived in a refugee camp, but also career-wise uh, was shunned. Uh, so he, he's got that terrible uh, feeling uh, in him. The uh, extraordinary positive of it is, is that um, he has a strategic mind of bringing his country into uh, a position of enormous influence in Africa. And so how he's brought in the social changes like uh, 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 Medicare, uh, school free schooling, uh, uh, support to, to families, moving families out of poverty from mud huts to, to small houses, uh, the rebuilding all the infrastructure. They've got, they've got fiber optics throughout the country. Uh, um, it, uh, attracting business and making it effective, fighting um, um, graph or what do you call that, uh, corruption. Uh, corruption. Uh, he, he had a minister of transport who was supposed to catch a plane to go to Germany to buy a couple dozen Mercedes for the ministers. And it hadn't gone by his office, but he found out about it. And he stopped the plane, got a hold of the minister, fired him and said, we don't run around in Mercedes in this country. And so they've got Toyotas or whatever the hell. And he, 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 he projects that. So his vision of, of uh, mixing the two ethnicities into one, because they speak the same language and religion and so on, uh, his uh, vision of building an economic base from which they can radiate from Rwanda throughout we are looking at Rwanda as being the hub of Africa for all our training, uh, and because they got a capacity to do it, they got a, a four-year military college. Uh, the, uh, uh, the officer corps is incredibly educated. Uh, the people don't uh, don't emigrate from Rwanda. Look at all the refugees that we got right, from Africa. There are something like two hundred some odd thousand. Africans sitting in Libya trying to get, a, get across the Mediterranean. There are no Rwandans. Rwandans stay in Rwanda because the conditions are better, the conditions are improving for their children and there's hope and education and so on. However, he is a benevolent autocrat. And some would say he's a dictator. Depends what scale do you look at in regards to human rights. And I believe that his concept was very correct. You don't start by bringing a country into being uh, after a civil war and so on by having free elections. There is nothing that can be more divisive in a country than free elections. And that's what they had imposed upon us. In two years, take a country that's had 100 years of, of, uh, of colonial rule, 25 years of a dictator, 
three years of civil war, and in two years, we want to have a free election. They didn't even have a, 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 a political party process. And that stress created enormous divisions because they were dividing up the jobs and so on. So I think that the elections is your end state of your democracy. But what is your importance is to stabilize the nation. And yes, I, I must say, I, I don't like the initial very, very heavy handedness that was going on, the paranoia to security. Uh, but that is ebbing slowly. And if he does another tour, he's preparing a Dauphin that will continue. Uh, the, the rhythm of growth of that nation as being a significant uh, powerhouse in Africa. The, the, the Rwandans have 6,000 peacekeepers, including peacekeepers in Haiti. And they are the best in all of Africa. And he's, he develops that construct of building a nation one Saturday a, a month, the whole nation is doing uh, community work, picking up garbage, doing that. Uh, uh, it, it is quite extraordinary. But he is ruthless. And uh, I've never hidden that. But the man is brilliant. Well, some. Yes, ma'am. So did everybody hear that? The question was, if Canada were to go to Mali, would, would we be able to make a positive contribution, basically? And, or should we even contemplate going? And yeah. And I think that, um, uh, and I, I did the, the African trip with the Minister of Defense uh, mm. last summer. Um, and um, the African nations, uh, who have been able to reach a level of stability, and there's a number of them who have. Uh, they're not all imploding or failing states. Um, they seek to professionalize. They want to build capacity in their own people. They, 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 don't, they don't need a whole bunch of white men and women coming to help them. They want to take uh, the situation in hand, but they need support to do that, and they do need capacity to be brought in. So uh, just like in the 60s, when many of these countries had their independence, Canada sent a whole bunch of military, uh, not just to the Congo when they had that uh, uh, insurrection. But uh, I was testifying in front of the International Tribunal in Arusha, Tanzania, and the commander of the staff college came for supper, and he brought a Canadian military volume on staff duties that we gave them in the 60s still being used today. Uh, so we, we help many countries build their military. It is now to go back and bring them to the next level and to build more depth, more capacity, more uh, uh, intellectual flexibility in their forces, uh, give them an opportunity to, and, and the politicians to comprehend that the military is an asset, military and police are an asset to the nation and not to the government in power only. Um, so um, I don't see us sending battalions anymore unless we have a, some incredible situation that, uh, that, that calls for it. I do see us sending a lot of people who can support training, support transition to technology. I can see us uh, providing uh, equipments and that technology with the proper control. Uh, I see us helping in their staff colleges and their institutions. Uh, I see us deploying with them. So you, you get, a, I don't know, a contingent from, uh, from Chad, okay, that have significant internal problems. So we embed a bunch of our people in the battalion and we, we train up with them for, for three, four, five months. And then we deploy with them and build that capacity from within. That's what we were doing in Afghanistan. Uh, and so uh, I think that uh, 
that's the route we're going to go. Mali, uh, I think there's, a, um, there's work to help contingents going in. There can be some tasks that we could do with the Dutch and the Germans and, uh, and uh, the French. Um, I have been arguing for Central African Republic because it's ripe to want to come out of its morass. We don't have any diplomatic capability. We don't have anything there ideal for us to go in and start from scratch with a country and help them build, build capacity. And so I, Mali is, is an option, uh, but there's South Sudan uh, also. There's still work to be done in the Congo. Uh, we haven't even talked about Burundi. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, uh, Darfur. Um, I think that we also should be looking at uh, the Middle East and how we can help nations not fall into conflict. So I think there's a, a lot of that type of employment uh, which, will, which will hone our own skills in understanding the complexities there because we're now training the police forces in Halifax, Montreal, Toronto, and Edmonton in how to prevent uh, extreme, extreme violence ra radicalism using stuff that we're doing overseas. Uh, and so there's stuff that with those people serving overseas will come back and bring skills here to help us. <coughs> if we went to the Central African Republic, what size of force would you say that would require. I mean, because I'm, I'm on the defense review at the moment, we're looking how many could we deploy at any one time? <coughs> how much money could we spend? I mean, would you be talking about 500 troops? Would you be talking about a major deployment or, or a minor deployment? I think that uh, the, if, if it was Central African Republic, uh, we would be looking probably at a battalion. And if you got a battalion, you got to add another. A battalion another is what? About 1,000. About 1,000. So you got to add another 1,000 for the medical, the support, and all that kind of stuff. and <coughs> helicopters and the sophisticated equipment. Uh, so that would be a, a major endeavor. Uh, I think that in, in Mali, uh, you don't need that capacity, that You've level. 51 other countries already there, so. Yeah, well, yeah, but uh, I had 26 countries, but some of them provided me with two guys right. Right. who were who a waste of rations to start with, so. Uh, <laughs> right. Well, we won't ask which countries they were from. <laughs> Read my book. <laughs> <coughs> so, we got here yeah, we are. Lady. this young lady has a question. Do you want to take the mic maybe and then people could share it? Um, so, I have a twofold question. Um, the first part of it, it relates to your comment about if more. Uh, women who worked in NGOs moved into the military, how that might change um, the approaches that, that are taken. Is there, is there room for that type of um, interaction to actually occur? I ask from the perspective of being a humanitarian aid worker, having been in the field, mm. particularly in East Africa, from Somalia to Sudan for the last sort of mm. ten, ten to 15 years, um, even Tanzania. Um, which is, has a changing, evolving <laughs> environment these days. And, and, and yet I, I rarely see that level of actual inter interaction between military and, and NGOs, um, they're, they're yeah. un un unless it's in an extreme situation, um, such as you know, Yemen um, at the moment. The mm. second part no, of the- No, let me do it, let's yeah. handle the first part. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if you know a chap called James Urbinski. Yeah, I do. Uh, okay, yeah. so James Urbinski and I, doctor, Médecins Sans Frontières, Nobel Peace Prize, all that good stuff. James, James was with me in Rwanda and he ran a hospital uh, throughout that, uh, nearly alone. Uh, the ICRC was in another, another spot. And uh, James and I have shared the podium often on the debate of humanitarian space. Right? You got humanitarians and NGOs, and then you got security. And we cannot uh, mix the security with the NGOs because that's going to 
effective neutrality and, uh, and the military are not trained to do uh, NGO work uh, and vice versa, of course. Uh, and I, uh, I argue that that is how it is today and how it was, but that's not the future. It, you cannot have these parallel capabilities, these parallel disciplines, thinking that you're actually bringing solutions. What you got is, is, is frictions, you've got often wastage, uh, you've got also the, the, the belligerents playing one against the other. But neither is the military capable of doing the humanitarian work to the extent that you can. They can do emergency stuff. And the NGOs can, cannot do and, and don't want to do necessarily military security stuff, be it even police and so on. So we're in this, in this uh, situation that the solution requires us to integrate these disciplines so that they reinforce each other. And, and create a synergy. Uh, and there is a, a reticence uh, that is not intellectually profound. It's experientially established in the field uh, that uh, we must maintain uh, that, that humanitarian space uh, or else we, we will not, both of us, be able to, to function. And so um, I, I am telling you that uh, one of the dominant elements to change that is to change some of the recruiting processes we're doing in the security forces, police and military, and make it a fundamental objective to raise the presence of women in those, in those forces. And they will change our philosophy of leadership. They will, they will adjust it. They will affect the doctrine and the tactics and the training and so on. And the mixture of that will make it much, much more amiable to be able to break that code and break that barrier. Uh, and so uh, the future is not today because what we're doing today is inefficient, in friction, uh, and in fact, they spend more time fighting amongst each other than they actually often uh, get things done in the field, I, I fear. Uh, and so I, 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 I had NGOs uh, that, that left, they all left when the, sh the shooting started, and then I permitted them to come in when I felt the level of security was okay. But some of them snuck in, and they were giving uh, uh, all kinds of support to the rebels. So when I found that out, I went out and checked what they were doing, and they were giving food and fuel and so on for uh, refugees or internally displaced up on the hill there. And I, and I said, uh, who's up there checking the distribution? Nobody, because it was too risky to go up there. How much of that stuff do you think actually made it to the refugees? And the concept of uh, negotiating with warlords and saying, you know, we can make it through these barriers without the military uh, by uh, paying a tax. You know? So we'll give them 10% of the stuff we have to be able to get 90% through. And I say that's unethical because you need 100% and more to start with. And that 10% is sustaining those guys to continue to create more casualties and more work uh, for you in the future. It's unethical to operate that way. So what's the other solution? That's the core of my fourth book to come out. <laughs> <laughs> I look forward to reading it. <laughs> So you get one last question, it and then we're going to have to draw it to a second, close. Um, uh, second question is, and this relates more to your efforts around child sol soldiers. Yeah. Um, I come from a family military background as well in Sri Lanka, which has had significant issues. Yeah. Um, a martyred and, country. And I, yeah. I probably am a black sheep in the family because I went to the NGO side. <laughs> um, and. And, and so what I have found really interesting as an adult working in East Africa, specifically Kenya, Somalia, dealing with issues around, um, around the reintegration of um, foreign fighters, children coming mm. back from Libya, from Syria even, Kenyans, Somalis, um, Tanzanians, mm. um, in your experience now with, with the capacity building that you're doing, where would you say there have been examples of good practice mm. 
for the rehabilitation and reintegration of yeah. children back into society? Um, I'm glad we have another half hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's go back to Rwanda and remember that the slaughtering that was done there was done by about 10,000 inter Amory militia who were a youth movement of a political party that were turned into a militia. They were kids, 15, 16, 17, 18, adults guiding them. The bulk of the killing was done by them. And so uh, I got involved with Grasha Michelle and, and the, the studies she did and uh, the work in regards to child soldiers and uh, did my, my research and realized that the world is seeing the increasing numbers of child soldiers in the tens and tens and tens and some say hundreds of thousands. Um, and uh, they're becoming even more ruthless and more, uh, uh, more trained. Um, and what the international community has been doing has been uh, concentrating on rehabilitation and reintegration. So on picking up the ones that survive and trying to reintegrate them into society. So two things about that side. One is there's re-recruitment. A child soldier uh, that has been demobilized and so on is a great asset. So child, uh, how do you say that uh, when they're uh, illegally uh, moved, uh, what do you call it? Trafficking. Mm -hmm. So child soldiers, I found when I was in Sierra Leone during the war, I've, we found demobilized Sierra Leone kids fighting in Cote d'Ivoire. So there's re-recruitment re that is still there. Secondly, the child soldier leader, the kid who's 14 going on 25, who, who's been leading 40 kids for the last two or three years, where all the other kids show deference to him, who has this extraordinary potential. Instead of creating, bringing them together and creating a school on leadership and give them four years of training and bringing the other kids in, like we have our own schools, and turn the child into somebody who will be a leader for the country. These kids are just thrown in with the others. And so he's 14, having to learn with seven-year-olds, Dick and Jane, uh, and in the end gets pissed off, goes back into the bush, and destroys all the work that we're doing uh, in trying to reconcile. So the billions that we spent in rehabilitation and integration have done nothing in reducing the scale of recruitment of child soldiers. Uh, now, why then uh, are we spending all that money on that side for those that have survived? Because the, the once, they're, once they're recruited, the scale of losses is astronomical. The number of kids that die, I mean, the minute they're injured, they just throw them away. They're sick, they throw them away. Uh, bring discipline, they shoot them. Uh, they, they double them up. The number of girls who have died of, of HIV AIDS because they've been uh, raped so often and, and, and uh, or their children that they've had from rape uh, dying. So the scale of loss is astronomical. So they don't even get the rehabilitation. So I said, why don't we try to make this weapon system ineffective? Why don't we make it that it's not such a good idea to recruit children because they're not that good? And how do you make them not good? Is by providing forces that face them who are good, who are able to bring them out and render them less effective. And so an example, uh, when we started uh, our field trials and so on, um, we'd, we'd use experienced peacekeepers. And we put them in a, in a uh, coming up with a convoy to a roadblock. And there were child soldiers there. And so uh, the child soldier said, no, you're not allowed through. So some guys just threw money at them, and that was fine. Except that by the 10th barrier, the price had gone up a hell of a lot, <laughs> and they weren't making it through, or food, or whatever. So that's not the way. But most of them, what they did is they backed off. They said, well, we'll, we'll go back, and we'll have somebody come and negotiate, and we'll, you know, we'll wait. Well, that makes the child soldier effective, because you've lost ground. You know, you've, you've, you've not achieved your mission. So we teach them the tactics of how to in fact de-escalate and be able to maneuver there without killing the children. 
because right now that's essentially the only doctrine that there's been. So make them ineffective by making the forces that face them more effective and using tools that don't necessarily put them at risk. Children, when they're in a firefight, use that often as a way to escaping. So how do you create scenarios to do that, let alone killing some of the leaders, of course? And yeah, some of those children will die in that. And the second part is, is that how do you stop them being recruited in the first place? So we're in the education program uh, with comic books and other means and ex-child soldiers and, and teaching them how not to get sucked in, in the schools. Uh, and what we discovered, as an example, Sierra Leone, I come back, they had an 11 year war of all child soldiers. So we, we went into the schools and we added to the curriculum um, uh, a program of explaining what a child soldier is and what it's like and, and so on and, and with comic books and other pedagogical tools did that. Then we got a call that we had to go back to the school because the parents wanted to meet us. So we said we, we failed, you know, we're always pessimistic. Anyways, we go back there. The parents said that that evening was the first time they were able to talk to their children about child soldiers because either they had been one or they'd suffered at the hands of one. And now the child had a good basis that they could explain it and it could make sense. And so uh, uh, preventive recruitment uh, is also part of our program uh, that, that, that we work with. You got to stop the inflow. That's, that's the, the solution. Yeah, take care of them. And you know what? We've spent that much on stopping the inflow. And that's where I think uh, we've got to do. There's been efforts by the Red Cross and there and so on and so on, but they've not broken the code uh, of actually being able to reduce significantly those numbers. And that's, that's where I think it, it's essential. You got to get rid of that weapon system. If it was a tank, I'd have an anti-tank system. It's a child soldier. I need much better trained, new doctrine in these militaries and security forces and working intimately with the NGOs. So in the final example, fire uh, UNICEF, we work a lot with them because they, they really were the lead and, and often are the lead in the field. I have a lot of time for them. So, uh, not necessarily the national headquarters, uh, but the, uh, the international headquarters. In the field. In the field. So, um, we, we get the, the uh, uh, UNICEF is in South Sudan. And it, it wants to talk to the military leaders and the political military leaders to stop the recruiting of the children because all these factions have got very fast uh, mobilized recruitment of children and then they, they got power. Uh, and uh, their first meetings with them was essentially telling, telling the military commanders, you have now created a crime against humanity, we're gonna throw you in jail and you better stop this and so on and threatening and so on. So what did those generals do? They threw them out. So they asked us to go in. So uh, within a day, we were able to get the meeting. Within a couple of days, we had a work session with them. Uh, and uh, we wanted to prove that we could reduce this. So uh, they sent me uh, with a small uh, colleagues, a small a few number of my colleagues, into the north, northeast part of South Sudan in the, the Dragon areas. Uh, and uh, to meet with that, quite virulent commander and their, their, their politicians. So we arrived there, they were willing to talk to us, they talked to me anyways, and so I sat down with them in, in quite difficult conditions, but still, we sat down, and the first thing I asked them was, is how are you handling the child soldiers from your opposing forces? Uh, you know, I mean, how, how, what do you do about that? What are your, your tactics to, to face these child soldiers? These guys are using child soldiers a lot. And within two hours, not only had I shifted it to his child soldiers, but we ended up with just under 300 kids released that afternoon. So you, you can break the code by talking their language and introducing 
and the tactics. And that's what we're doing. Well, I think Thank that's you. major. So I think, so, so, well, uh, I, know, I know there are many more questions, General, but I just, maybe on behalf of the audience, I'd just like to say to you that you're admired for many things. Uh, but it seems to us that you brought from the horror of Rwanda a personal story that makes us all more aware of our own humanity, but you've transcribed that into a social and political story which enable us to try and understand how we have to rectify these terrible situations, whether it's child soldiers, whether it's the, our own forces and how they are properly treated, or basically how we address the whole problem of the, source, the sources of war and how we can, at a macro level, try and deal with it. So you've transformed your personal experience into something that has been a learning experience for us all. You brought it here and shared it with us tonight. I want to thank you very much on behalf of this audience, both for what you've done and what you will be doing in the future. Thank you, sir, for joining us. D you were, you were, yeah. You put a microphone in front of a general and you're in for a long haul. Uh -oh. As General Fraser, I'm sure, would participate. Oh, we're not getting that. him down here. No, 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 no. The, the, it would never end. Uh, I, I have to indicate that the minister was at a time when we were going through major adjustments into the world uh, with Darfur and so on, mm -hmm. and how to use forces and what to use and how to link it with our uh, foreign policy and so on. We are now in this particular year at a, at a similar crossroads uh, of uh, abandoning the Syrias and the Libyas and, um, uh, and uh, um, essentially fiddling in Africa, uh, you know, throwing a couple, couple guys there in, uh, with the UN or abandoning the UN still. We have an ability now to, to become again a significant leading middle power in the world and you cannot imagine how much those countries are seeking our return. Our work ethic, our, 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 our mastery technology, uh, our belief in human rights, uh, the fact that we don't want to subjugate anybody else, although we're still screwing up at our First Nations, but, but uh, those are things they believe that we can, in fact, inculcate in the world. And our absence it has been horrific to many of them. And I'll give you one example because I think it's significant. We didn't get that seat in the Security Council. Some of us were really pissed off, really pissed off, because we are an extraordinary bridge between the big powers and the developing nations, and we bring innovative approaches. And a lot of those changes I spoke of around 2000, we started that, our diplomats, our diplomatic corps and, and, and soldiers and so on, we did that. If I was pissed off, it was nothing compared to those countries. With the minister and separately when I go to the different countries and they, and they say, you abandoned us by not fighting for that seat. And they are in desperate need for a country, a leading middle power, where they were one of the 11 most powerful nations in the world, a leading middle power in this 150th anniversary and so on of, of, uh, of engaging in changing the flow of how conflict can be prevented. And that's the aim, not resolved, but prevented. And so push the government to get off its butt and take the decision and get us back into the field. Thank right. you very much. Right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much.